our call to order and now roll call. Board Member Parks. Okay. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Board Member Bennett. Here. Board Member Brennan. Present. Board Member Foy. Uh, here. Board Member Long. Yes. Board Member Morgan. Present. Board Member Sharkey. Board Member Tucker. Board Member Zaragoza. Here. And Board Member Ramirez. Okay. Well, uh, now is our time to do the Pledge of Allegiance and uh, uh, Mr. Brennan, would you please lead us? Thank you. Ready to begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our next item on the agenda is the minutes of our meeting of September 10th. Do we have a motion? We have a motion from... Board member Zaragoza. Second. And a second from Ms. Long. Uh, is there any opposition? No? No abstains? And we'll just deem those then as unanimously approved. My apologies. So glad you're here. Uh, we'll go ahead and go to the agenda review section of our agenda and I'll turn over the meeting to our chair Ms. Ramirez. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I did the pledge. All right. Are there any um, additions or uh, corrections uh, to the agenda? We have no agenda review. No agenda review. All right. Next item is I do we need a motion on that? No. Okay. All right. My apologies. Okay. All right. We do have a public comment at this time. One speaker, Mr. Kevin Tohill. Do I, did I say that right? Yes. Yes. All right. Proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, board, staff, and our community. My name is Kevin Toho, and I live at Walnut and Tapel Canyon on a small street called Lightning Ridge Way. I apologize, it's emotional. Excuse me. I'm, you, you, excuse me. You, you, you sound nervous and relaxed, not one, but two. I didn't quite clear where, where, where you live. Simi Valley, California. Simi Valley. All right, great. Welcome here. All right. And my name is Kevin Tohill. All right, great. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. Um, deep breath. I live there with my wife and my three kids, Caitlin, who is six, Dylan, who is four, and Austin, who is two. There are other families with young kids on our street as well. There are three oil wells and one storage facility adjacent to my property, owned by Barnett Oil family. The neighbors and I have noticed a strong gas fumes coming from this facility. I filed a complaint on August 27th regarding this issue with you guys. On August 29th, Eric Weatherby followed up with his complaint and did his inspection and informed me that they were exempt from vapor recovery under the Clean Air Act. I have lived in this location for over 10 years and have never had this issue before. I moved onto the property. At that time, there were lanterns in place in my neighboring property, which burned off the gases. This system is now abandoned, and this year they turned off the valves and capped off the old pipes of the system and rebuilt the lid and the hatch to the storage tank. Sometimes during this process, something during this process is causing these, all these gases to be released onto my property and into the community. This is a daily occurrence in which this valve makes noise and releases gases into the air, sometimes as often as every few minutes. I've spoke and met with Sally Barnett and Richard Nolley in hopes they would design and implement a new vapor recovery system for this facility. When I met with Kirby from APCD, he recommended a carbon filter system versus the old flare system. As you all well, I have spoken with many of you on this issue, and I'm asking you for help. 
for our community to achieve clean air. Your mission statement is to protect the public's health from adverse effects of pollution. These gases are pollution, and I feel working together, we can make the community safe again. I can give you a copy afterwards. I'm doing the best I can. It's been over 60 days, and we are still hopeful on the Bernard family will install a vapor recovery system. Whatever you guys could do to expedite this installation of this vapor recovery system would be appreciated. According to your permit number 1146 and the operating management plan, management of the tank farm must be maintained, inspected, and repaired per your regulation. The well, the, um, there are multiple places on my neighbor's property where old fittings are failing and oil is seeping into the soil. The well basin has more than four inches of oil in it. When the truck the tank truck or pumps for oil from the facility, they spill oil into the ground and, and there's no cleanup. These spills are within 25 feet of an open inlet of a channel. The property adjacent to me is saturated with oil and the Bernard family should be responsible to clean it up. In closing, as an architect who has studied urban design and community planning, and who is passionate about mixed use, I do not feel all occupancies can be adjacent. The idea that an oil facility exempt from vapor recovery and a residential house can be adjacent, or even in this case, on the same property, is absurd. We should have regulations from cities and counties to not let these adjacencies occur. The city of Simi Valley is about to approve senior housing adjacent to one of these oil wells. During the planning of this new senior housing, they didn't realize that this facility was exempt from vapor recovery. We as design professionals, parents, and design professionals, parents, and governmental authorities shall do what we can to protect our kids, our families, grandparents, and, our, and the future generations. Whew. Thanks again for all that have helped to address this critical issue. My kids are very excited about Santa Claus and Christmas. They are working very hard on their Christmas list. I hope we can have the vapor recovery system installed and be able to let the kids play safely outside in our backyard on Christmas Day. It's been over 60 days that we've not been able to use our backyard. Whatever you guys can do to help, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for coming and expressing your uh, concerns. I would like to ask Mr. Vegas to, um, at the as early as possible, give us a report on the situation. He, he may know about this, prop <laughs> this property. Yes, terrific. Thank is you. This in, Madam Chair, is it yes. environmental health or, or? Thank you. Thank you, board. The city of CMS. The city. Yes, Mr. Tillhill uh, contacted us in August, and we did a, a full compliance inspection. Uh, two days after that. Uh, we've also sent our engineering manager, Kirby Zozula, out to meet with Mr. Tohill at his property, uh, took some photos, and we're working with Dogger, uh, Division of Oil, Gas, and Geothermal Resources, and we're going to be trying to get out to that facility to walk the property, and we're also working with the consultant. For, it, it's owned by a, uh, a retiree. It's a very small operation. We're talking three small wells and one tank. And what Mr. Toho told you is correct. It is exempt from vapor recovery. As you're aware, when we adopt a rule, we look at cost effectiveness. In other words, how many dollars would the operator have to spend to reduce X amount of pollution in, in, in dollars per pound and on an annualized basis. And unfortunately, due to the size, this is a very small, I have to put this in perspective. This is pumping three barrels a day. This is an extremely small facility, and that's why this tank is not required to have vapor recovery at this time. But we are working with the operator and their consultant, and it seems that, oh, kind of a little bamboozling on our part, they are open to the idea of putting vapor recovery on the tanks. Now, 
the amount of gas they produce is, is so small, they would not be able to sell it to Southern California Gas in, in, into, the, uh, into that network. But it could be, in the past it was burned in lanterns. But we could do one better than that, I believe, working with them and with perhaps a, a shrouded type flare that would allow them to burn those vapors so they would not be smelling those ROCs from the oil field operation. Has your, has your staff confirmed the vapors, the smell? Oh, yes. It's, yes. It's, so there definitely is a problem. There, there's an issue. That, that you've that confirmed that. independently. Yes. Wow. Well, this is the immediate health and safety issue. There's another thing that, I, that concerned me is when he said there was oil on the ground and had been saturated in soil for a long time. I know for sure that when you spill oil, you're supposed to take the dirt away. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's people that rent out their backhoes to do that for the oil companies. Um, is, that, is the oil saturated in the ground there? He just showed me some photos mm -hmm. that, that, that lead me to believe, yes, it is, it's getting into the ground. And that's why Dogger really needs to be there at this inspection. I, go ahead. If I could, so um, there are vapors that you have verified. Can APCD require action as a result of these verified vapors? That's it, it's going to be difficult on a nuisance angle. That's the only angle we really have from a legal standpoint. And 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 why is that difficult? Generally, you're supposed to have six complainants, roughly a half dozen, but but. I don't think it's really going to matter in this case because the operator is willing to install vapor recovery. Well, can Dogger then take over? Well, I think Dogger can address some of the issues dealing with oil getting into the soil. Yeah, but the but Dogger's we, going we, to sit there and say, we don't do vapors. We're do vapors. Yeah. And it's we're going to handle the vapors. It, in our, Who? Our, we are going to handle the vapors. We handle the, vapor the vapors, and it's our policy then that we have a basis that is on cost recovery. That's how we do it. So if the cost recovery isn't there, then we don't require it. Is that what you're saying? To for, me, for you know, you need to, we need to put aside cost recovery when it comes to public health. Obviously, that has to be the primary responsibility. Absolutely. So in, in this particular case, it sounds like we need to do that. Absolutely. Well, yeah, yes. I mean, and it, the rule and we adopted. might want to revisit that policy, too. Well, the policy deals with, with when you're adopting a rule, how stringent do you make the rule? And we're, we're not, I can't say for certain that there's a public health issue. There are vapors, yes. So from a nuisance standpoint, you say we require six, but what if there are not six residents that live in close enough to the area? We still require six? Could we change our policy and say we require 100% of the people that live within a certain distance? I've asked I that mean, very I mean, it, just, it, it creates a, an impossible situation if you don't have six uh, I've asked houses. that very question. We're and what's the person. answer? <laughs> the same person. The question is whether or not there is a public nuisance. The question is public nuisance, and that's defined under the Health and Safety Code as well as in the Civil Code. And it talks about a considerable number of persons. It doesn't even give the number five or six. Mm -hmm. Six is a number that has been developed over time through the air pollution control districts in the state of California, would, and most use that one. Would, would we be inappropriate if we said a considerable number is 100% of the residents within mm -hmm. certain distance? We could. Do, that would have to take some relooking at the um, uh, enforcement protocols that the APCD has developed over the years, but that would be within your authority to give direction to staff to come back I mean, to you and revisit nuisance issues. Yeah. I mean, it seems like you create, I mean, obviously the best thing would be for the property owner to just voluntarily put this vapor recovery on, uh, but and nothing if, you can't, if we have an impossible situation here, if there's vapors that are, I mean, you can and nothing say, say, hey, they just have to keep sucking these fuels mm -hmm. because there aren't six houses around. How many children are involved? Uh, he has three children. And a, uh, I assume a spouse, perhaps? What yes. is that? Um, but can you? Can, it looks like he said five when he said that. There was five. Yeah, Those, uh, um, we have three children. The neighbor across the street has one child who's 21, 23. The neighbor up the street has two young children, both, um, I believe she's seven and four. And the neighbor who the oil wells are actually on, they have an eight year old. And an older son who's probably about six. It's more than yeah. six individuals. Uh, uh, let me just ask this so question. There's definitely as, more than six as, people as, who can call. I've called and Yeah, because he, he's, he's in the middle of a subdivision area where there's an oil well there and there's a bunch of homes all around it. And because have we got any other complaints from anybody else yeah. before this? Yeah. Or is, uh, 
We have one other complaint from the actual property owner that has the lease on his property. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. So I, I guess what I was going to ask is, because, our, like I said, our job at public safety, what is, the, well, you said, I'm not sure what I can, I mean, when that natural gas is going out, is it a public safety issue, though? Do you guys? I mean, it's, are we, can we? <laughs> it's mostly natural gas, okay. But there are, since you're working with crude oil, there are going to be some light-ins, the propanes, butane, ethane. And also, all crude oil has a small amount of toxics in it, which are known as BTEX, benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, xylene. Now, they're, they're trace amounts. And one yeah. thing that we wanted to work with the operator was is to do some testing to determine if there actually is an issue at that situ in that situation. But the bottom line is the operator, what we understood is that operator, she has said, let's just resolve this issue. Let's fix the problem. Our council would like to say something. Yeah, um, I don't want to put too much of an end to this discussion, but under yeah, the Brown Act Open Meetings yeah. Law, this is a non-agendized oh, item. And we're getting into a discovery issue and asking about laws and facts and circumstances. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that uh, the speaker has provided the APCD with a substantial amount of information that they can follow up, and it's well within your authority to uh, direct Mr. Viegas and his staff to go forward with an investigation and the issues of nuisance whether they be public or private are valid ones and that also was well within your discretion to direct uh, Mr. Viegas and his staff to look into that policy so I okay we I'd, got it beyond I'll that try. I think that we're I okay with this that item we, and I, that we should it. not go any further okay if you want to do a formal we, do we can re-agendize this and have have this right. whole issue of, okay. of vapor recovery and and complaints uh, settled for a much larger discussion because it does involve the landowner who has the wells and and the, uh, the pumps. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Your Honor, I would it, support uh, definitely putting it on the agenda because it looks like we may want to review the policies that are in place. Sure. Mr. Morgan, I'll second that with a comment. I'd like to make sure when we talked about costs, you know, for recovery or you, costs. We, for it's me, not a motion because we're we going can't too have far. A it's not a motion <laughs> because you can't yeah. have a okay. motion because it's not on the agenda. There's so a it's direction. just a. Yes. Okay. I think we. Okay, but well, we, we, you know. we understand we're going. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for coming in. I know you, you. You got a letter here from the city that it talked about it too, and so we understand that. Thank you. Yeah, Thank our council's you. trying Thank to keep us uh, it. Thanks for coming safe in. here. Thank, Thank you so much. Hope, Thanks hope, for coming in. Hope you have a merry Christmas with your kids. Right. Yeah. I hope it, I hope it's solved by Christmas. You're right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so I think, uh, I think staff has heard uh, what the board's interested in here with this matter. The next item, I don't think we have any other public comments. I just had one speaker card. Uh, the next item is board comments. Do any members of the board have comments to make? Mr. Morgan. Just one. Uh, we had a meeting last month, uh, Mr. Vegas and I did, and it was a very interesting meeting. Um, that, that, the Tri-Counties meeting is always kind of fun. Um, we get new members from other counties and, and they come in, but one of the things... One of the issues that's going to be important to us is at the beginning of the year, they're going to start scoring, uh, seeing where we are in Prop 32, and, how, and evaluating, have we made steps to recover? Have we made steps to, uh, what do you call it, impose the, the conditions and so on? And one of those that surprised me was, it was brought up, was they're going to look at gas stations, see how close they are to houses, and if they're within a certain range, those gas stations may be limited on how much gas they can get. Now, that's going to affect every city here, seriously. But you want to follow up with that, Mike? That yeah, real quick, uh, the state is looking at the, the procedure used when you determine a health risk assessment. And what they found is looking at some pollutants, most notably uh, benzene being one of a perfect example with a gas station, uh, they are now taking into a, a, account the... the uh, the fact that children are exposed to it in the you know infant to two year old range, and they're looking at breathing rates, uh, resist you know the fact that children don't have a, as well developed uh, immune systems, etc., and that some of these toxics can actually impact a child much more than an adult uh, because of their developmental stage, and what it means is is if we did a risk analysis using the current protocol, it might be that you know, everything's fine at that location. <clears throat> but it looks like under the new procedures the state has developed for all the air districts in California to use, that that risk is going up by a factor of three. After you calculated under this new proposed procedure. So 
it would make it more difficult for certain cases for permitting to proceed. Or you may actually have to lower throughput at some locations. And that's, that's all I had. I just, that was the most important thing of it, and I thought that's going to cause a lot of concern with what's out there now along the freeway. If you've built anything up around a freeway that has housing, but you had gas stations on the freeway, it's going to hit those. So. Thank you. Other board comments? No? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go on to the um, item 8, which is presentation of a service award to our board member, Brian Brennan, for his service on this board. <laughs> so, uh, does, some, does someone have that? Yes, you do. Right. We'll miss you. Can't yes. <laughs> on behalf of staff, Please come Council Member Brennan, I just wanted to say that 11 years, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, you've been really supportive of our programs. And uh, the programs have worked in this county. You know, we've achieved the smog standards two times ahead of schedule. Uh, they tightened it again, but we'll go for a third. And uh, we've achieved the state particulate matter standard, which is remarkable. We'd always achieved the federal particulate matter standards. And as you're aware, I've sent your board a couple articles on, on the health effects that they've discovered from particulate matter being quite substantial. And the fact that we actually achieved the incredibly stringent state standards is remarkable. And I think a large part to the leadership of yourself and the other members of the board, this district's been able to move ahead with regulations. We've strived always. Uh, we get direction from you and, and the rest of the board members on exactly how to, we, we should proceed and generally with industry support or at least uh, no opposition. And it's been good. You've always balanced kind of the business needs and the environmental desires of, of the community and I think it's been it's been wonderful for, for me to work with you and I know on behalf of staff I just wanted to say thank you for your service and I wish you all the best in your future endeavors and with that I have a plaque for you I'd like to present to you yes I also like to commend uh, Brian and I've had the uh, pleasure of uh, serving with Brian and, and VRSD and for many many years and and also with Beacon and and of course with APCD, you know, and I just want to commend him for all the excellent work that, uh, that he's done and also, of course, uh, an excellent job that he did for the uh, Ventura City Council and I want to thank you for your service to the community. Okay. Other board members have comments? I just also want to compliment your dedication to the cause, too, and, and what a wonderful face to have for our APCD when you were chair, too, and, and representing us. So just appreciate the work you did in helping to lead us. Other board members? Yeah. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> uh, you've been a... Um, but, but you've been a steady uh, voice out there, and I think APCD is probably a classic kind of organization that you really helped because you, you've been there, you've, you've led a really thoughtful, incredible voice uh, to it, and a, and a passion for, for doing it right. And it's that kind of off the radar screen, you know. behind the scenes stuff that you really excel at. And um, so I know um, uh, there's some changes coming for you, but I, I don't for a minute think those changes mean you're going away, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and your well, influence isn't going to go away, so stay in there, hang in there. Right? Well, thank you for the kind words, and if I, I started to hit me that if I, all the boards and commissions, if they do this, actually, I would have been better off running for re-election. I think it would be actually a campaign, <laughs> but um, just because it, it as you know, it's not about me, it's about the work the organization does, and certainly I think that really we're all successful because of what staff does and the hard work the, that uh, certainly APCD is, uh, uh, employees and, and staff members are committed to. I think the thing that I'm most proud about being on this board and serving with you as a board, I think things that we are, is that while regulations have come down, we have tried to make sure we involve the people that are being regulated, that we actually talk, we don't do it to them, we do it in tandem with them. We try to we try to where we can, make sure that we can reach the goal, but in a way that brings them along and allows them to be a part of that. I think for the business community, the ag community, I think uh, from the uh, uh, Colin Moyer grants to why we, we consider ag so important to this to this county, we have to be able to back it up when we can, where we can, and I think while regulation gets tighter and tighter, our opportunity to be able to somewhat soften those regulations or, more importantly, get to the goal, but also be able to facilitate through funding so that the 
that technology can get them to that goal. So I think that's, I know whoever steps up will have some, will be working in tandem with you also. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brennan. I would like to echo the comments of my colleagues about your service and thank you for it. And we know that you're still going to be very involved in our community, making it a better place. Other board members? Your Honor, just one thing. Um, I know Mike and I, I mean, Mr. Brennan here, and I know what he's going to do. He's going to go out and take some surfing, surfing lessons more often That's right. <laughs> and enjoy life a little more. Um, but I would like to know what he's going to do now this off the city council and off this board. What's your intentions in the future? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I certainly am going to stay active in, in regional issues and uh, certainly um, in beach erosion issues and coastal issues. And I um, have, uh, uh, while I will be um, stepping down from city council, I think, you know, I certainly am working here at the county and as a uh, uh, partner with Supervisor Bennett in good government and, and issues. But I do hope to maintain uh, my, I uh, asked the governor to uh, point me to the public at large position on the mm -hmm. Coastal Commission instead of the elected position. And uh, that's something I have a passion for and certainly uh, um, he knows my record so he either wants me or he doesn't and that's okay. I'm all right with that and my life won't end if I'm not on the Coastal Commission but, uh, but I do think that um, from perspective of Starting off into government initially because all I wanted to do was get the water tested and, uh, and it's something that wasn't being done and realizing there was a lot more responsibilities to come with elected offices and this being one of them. And I think regional government, while we concentrate and focus on what's happening locally in our own community, we need to realize that also that community is part of the regional piece and, we, and should, needs to be a, a player and needs to step up and try to solve those issues. So I will try to stay active in that. You might or, see me in Camarillo uh, now that I can. No. Don't bring a fish along with you, though. <laughs> um, um, exactly. Madam Chair, if, if yes. I could point I might. I just might point out, just to give you an idea, it's a, one of those quiet behind the scenes things that people don't know, but um, you know, we've tried to keep the cost of government down in general, and Beacon has been one of those places where uh, there was a concern about whether there should be an increase in dues, et cetera, and uh, Beacon lost their executive director, their paid executive director. A number of years ago, I think about four or five years ago, and Brian Brennan stepped up and took on the range as the executive director of Beacon for free. And he has voluntarily run that organization, Beacon, which is a, a, a tremendous amount of time and, and commitment on his part. And he, he does it just strictly voluntary. And I know somebody came and really complained that it was an inside job, that he got it. And, all, and then when they found out he was doing it for free, they completely backed off on their complaints and everything else. But um, it just, you know, that's the kind of, that's the kind of service that he's brought to. to and the, the only thing that I'm, I belong to Beacon is, you know, the only uh, complaint that I have is once in a while he forgets the donuts. Right. You're coughing right. the donuts. That's right. You've forgotten the donuts for yeah. a long time, Jim. That's right. <laughs> Can we move on with the agenda, please? Right. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Well, thank you very much again. So I do appreciate your service, Mr. <laughs> Brennan. We wish you well. Thank um, you. Item 9, public hearing regarding approval of proposed new rule, 74.31 metal working fluids, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mr. Cowan. Yeah, Chair Ramirez, members of the board, Stan Cowan, air quality engineer. APCDD is proposing a new rule, 74.31, called Metalworking Fluids and Direct Contact Lubricants. This rule will reduce ROC emissions, reactive organic compounds, from a wide range of metalworking uh, facilities, including three metal forging operations, a metal parts manufacturing, and approximately 300 machine shops in the county. The new rule is considered to be a feasible measure under Health and Safety Code 40914 under the California Clean Air Act. Industry has already reformulated these products in response to work done by the South Coast District and adoption of their rule 1144. Uh, this rule was adopted in 2009 and amended in 2010 and is the basis for our proposed rule 7431. The Independent Lubricant Manufacturers Association, which is a national trade association, has worked closely with the South Coast District to adopt a reasonable and feasible control measure. APCD staff has worked closely with ILMA and Michael Pierce from Dodge Oil, who is a representative of ILMA, who is here actually today to support the rule adoption. And uh, it's been a great, a great uh, partnership. Proposed Rule 7431 will simply mean the substitution of the higher ROC products used for metalworking fluids 
with their low ROC counterparts. Add-on emission controls will not be required, though they are allowed by the rule, to comply with the proposed uh, ROC content limits, which are in the table in the rule. The rule's work is based on a, a technology assessment performed in 2006 by IRTA for the South Coast District and for ILMA, and, the, and uh, we estimate a reduction of about 41 tons of ROC emissions per year from this source. The cost effectiveness ranges from a cost savings to about 40 cents per pound. This is relatively inexpensive compared to new sources, which, are, which may spend as much as $9 per pound to reduce to, to comply with best available control technology requirements. Some of the new products, emulsion type products, actually increase production rates for some of these facilities and they, re, they result in extending tool life by as much as 50%, which results in a cost savings. In addition to this new rule, we are proposing to clarify Rule 23, which is a, a companion rule, which is our exemptions from permit. We're basically going to clarify the rule to allow existing facilities that are currently exempt to remain so, to remain exempt from APCD permits. Facilities such as metal forging operations, which are currently permitted by the district, will retain their permits based on, on their existing particulate matter emissions. An important aspect of this proposal is that it will be mi result in minimal administrative cost to local industry. For all affected sources, except for the metal forging, which currently have permits, APC permits and record keeping for emission sources will not be required. Instead, the proposed rule contains a, a sales prohibition, which basically prohibits the sale or distribution of non-compliant fluids that exceed the limits in the rule. Th these are the same requirements in the South Coast District. This places the burden of compliance on the manufacturers of the fluids, such as ILMA represents. They will supply legal products and educate their suppliers and, and customers of the proposed rule requirements. We have used sales prohibitions in other APC rules, including those for auto refinishing, architectural coatings, adhesives, and pleasure craft coatings. Federal, state, Clean Air Act laws require we adopt reasonable and feasible measures to meet our air quality goals. We, we met with, with industry several times. We had a public consultation meeting in April and a rule workshop in July. The, the advisory committee recommended unanimous approval this past August, and should your board adopt this proposal, both the health and safety code findings and the CEQA exempt status should also be adopted. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Board members have any, board members have any questions? It's just that I just want to repeat one thing. You, the industry itself is behind this or, or supporting this effort. Well, they're supporting it. They're, yeah, mm -hmm. it's a mutual. I do have a speaker card from Mr. Mike Pierce. Is it Pierce? Would you approach? Thank you very much. Madam Chairman, board members, thank you for this opportunity. ILMA, the Independent Lubricant Manufacturers Association, and the WS Dodge Oil Company, a local company based in Los Angeles and a member of ILMA, we heartily support and endorse passage of Rule 74.31 and the amendments to Rule 23. I would like to echo Stan's uh, comments about the good working relationship. This was very important to us because Rule 1144 took many years to develop. It was a very difficult process at times, but we came up with a compromise where not a single business has left the Los Angeles area because of Rule 1144. Nobody went out of business. Nobody was harmed. Yet, down there, they reduced the, the average emissions by 2.9 tons per day. So we felt it was a big win for us because our customers got to stay in business, and it was a big win for everybody breathing the air. So we were very pleased with the outcome. In working with staff here, there were a few minor changes that they were considering, but they listened to us, and as a result of that, the rule is essentially identical to Rule 1144. Why that's important for us is because we expect other non-attainment districts in California to be passing similar versions of this, and it would be extraordinarily difficult to have 10 different versions of the same rule. Um, somebody testified down south, you know, across the country because of the VOC issues, ROC, they would have to put 15 different ROCs or VOCs on the same can of, uh, of lubricant. By, by adopting this uh, pretty much intact, it works really well for us, and that's why we can support it. And I can tell you that for the ILMA members that I've spoken to at our meetings, 
Everybody is already in full compliance. There shouldn't be any difficulty whatsoever with replacement products. They're already in the marketplace, ready to go. The products are already labeled with VOC. This is a done deal. So we're, we're very happy to support this rule. Thank you very much. Uh, questions from the board? Comments? The Having approval of the uh, staff recommendation. Is there a second? second? Thank you. Um, I should say. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? No? Hearing none, that passes. Mr. Villegas, and thank you, Mr. Pierce, for coming. Um, and thank you, Mr. Cowan. Um, item 10, receive and file a report regarding current state local efforts to regulate practice of hydraulic fracking, et cetera. Yes, this is an update your board requested at the June meeting, and I just wanted to, to get back on the lay of the land on it because there's been some major changes with respect to how hydraulic fracturing is going to be regulated in the state. And I wanted to get that in front of your board. And there's really two things I'm going to be covering today. The first is the South Coast regulation that covers hydraulic fracturing and acidizing. And then I'll be discussing the recent legislation, SB4. In April of this board, the South Coast Air Quality Management District Governing Board adopted new rule 1148.2, which deals with basically a public right to know before well completion activities are undertaken or production stimulation activities are undertaken and disclosure of both emissions and the chemicals used in that process. I'd like to point out that it's an administrative rule in nature. This rule 1148.2 will not reduce emission reductions but will cover those public notification and disclosure requirements. The purpose of the rule and why we were so interested in work with South Coast on it is they want to determine whether existing district, whether South Coast or Ventura County air pollution control regs for the oil field are adequate to address the emissions, air emissions related to hydraulic fracturing and potentially acidizing, but in large part hydraulic fracturing. The only unfortunate thing we've had development wise on, on this rule is there's been extremely limited activity in the South Coast Air District with regards to hydraulic fracturing since the rule was adopted. So they haven't generated any data that allows us either district to evaluate our existing oil field rules and ours are quite similar to theirs. So I, I'm sorry, are you saying there's limited fracking in Ventura County? Limited fracking in South Coast at this time. Isn't it kind of hard to tell since they don't have to disclose when they're fracking? They do under the South Coast rule. And, oh, you're talking at that area? About, uh, the South okay. Coast region is Thank what you. I said, yes. Yeah. So okay. unfortunately, we, we, we were expecting their rule to generate data we could utilize, and unfortunately that hasn't occurred yet. But we will stay in contact with the South Coast contacts on this issue. Mike, are they still gathering? On that last one, data is not yet available. Um, are they still gathering that kind of data? They will so be gathering that so data, data be yes. brought back to us again as they get the data. Yes. On the other hand, when we talk about major changes, I think Senate Bill 4, Pavley, completely changed the landscape regarding hydraulic fracturing and acidizing. I'm going to touch on the main requirements of this regulation. First, by January 1, 2015, the Secretary of the Natural Resources Agency must complete an independent scientific study of well stimulation treatments, including acidizing and hydraulic fracturing. The study needs to evaluate the potential hazards that these stimulation act treatments pose to natural resources looking at both air, water, and land impacts. Also, we'll be looking at public, occupational, and environmental health and safety issues. Also by January 1, 2015, Department of Oil and Gas and Geothermal Resources, or DOGGER, is required to adopt rules and regulations dealing with acidizing and hydraulic fracturing. And it's going to require pre-notification. It's going to require, uh, I talked about zonal isolation in, in June. And, and what that means is what are the requirements for that well casing to make sure that the fluids being injected in are not somehow able to leak into a groundwater table or aquifer. So they'll be looking at geologic isolation also of the, of the oil and get the fracked zone also. 
They're also directed to work with local air pollution control districts and many other state agencies in developing these regulations. Lastly, by January 1, 2015, is that Dogger needs to enter into formal agreements with local APCDs and other agencies clearly delineating who has regulatory authority for which aspect of these operations. And that's something we'll be working with Dogger obviously on because really the second and third bullets are where the air district is, is pulled into SB4. By January 1st, 2016, Dogger must have a new website in place to disclose the fluids used in hydraulic fracturing or acidizing, the chemical composition of those, and it has to be also the pre-notification is going to be there. Everything you need to know about that fracking job is going to be there. And until they get this new website uh, developed, they'll be utilizing frac focus in the interim. The biggest change I think that's, that's here today is the fact that in order to do these well stimulation treatments, the operator is going to need a permit prior to taking those actions from Dogger. So this is something completely new. This is a requirement to let the state know if you're going to undertake this operation. Lastly, is that going to be on existing wells and new wells? I believe it's on all wells. Great. Right. Awesome Lastly, by July 1st, 20. 15, the State Water Resources Board needs to come up with criteria for groundwater monitoring to ensure the safety of the, that aquifer near, it can be done on a well-by-well -well basis, this protocol, or on a regional basis. But they need to come up with those requirements. Uh, that's it in a nutshell, and these are major changes in the way I think California is going to have this regulated uh, quite stringently, and hopefully the activity can continue when the natural resources will be protected as well. That's all I have. I'll be happy to take any questions. Questions from board members? Mr. Bennett? The, the, you know, the data that we're waiting for from South Coast, um, are they only collecting it on fracking or are they collecting it on all well stimulation activities? All well stimulation. Okay, so not just fracking. Great. Thank you. Questions? The process uh, when permits will be required is January 2016? I believe that's current. I mean, there was not a date in the legislation, so my understanding is that they need permits. The, uh, the second bullet there, permits from Dogger will be required for well stimulation treatments. That, that, it, that isn't under the January 16th. That's 16. correct. It's not under the January 1, 16. That's, so that you think that's currently a requirement for that's existing? That's my understanding. Uh, I'll double check that with Dogger staff. Okay. I, I find that to be a key question. <laughs> it <laughs> because, is. I will get that to um, you. <laughs> whether existing wells are required to have permits if they're acidizing or they're fracking. And if they don't, when will they be required to have the dogger permits? And it looks like we're not even, we won't know whether they are or not until they are on this frac focus website. And that's required in January of 2015. My understanding is that's required now, but the new website that isn't frac focus is required by January 1, 2016. I, I don't believe it's required now. I believe it's required by January 1 of 2015. Oh. I mean, 2014. is That's when the disclosure requirements of SB4 kick in, I believe, is okay. January 1. That's my understanding. Tom, at number two. I'm almost ahead. certain about that. If you, go back one if you go back one slide, I think it shows it. Um, the dogger shall adopt regulations for well stimulation treatments, et cetera, in that. Um, that's oh, that's by so 115. But by 114, they have to start dis dis notifying and disclosing. I'm almost certain I was, I was at Fran Pavley's event, and she talked about she's a little concerned about the, the window for the next six weeks uh, in terms of what kind of activity takes place in the, for the rest of 13. Yeah, I, and I, I probably will leave every the permitting, and you're correct on the permitting and the disclosure, and it's because it wasn't an urgency measure. This the legislation. So it didn't take effect immediately. It takes effect, as you're aware, on January 1, the following year after it's enrolled in chapter. My, um, the uh, material that is used for frac 
nicotine or other materials that's injected into wells. Is that also covered by SB4? That yes, they it had is. To report to those you? materials, those frac fluids, will have to be disclosed on that website. And then they, one of the big glitches Dogger had is they didn't have, unlike air districts, they didn't have regulations to deal with trade secrets. And Dogger is going to have to develop those also. So the collection wells that are collecting materials from different uh, uh, companies that inject into wells, that material has to be uh, reported and see what the ingredients are, what the makeup is. Of that's that. how I understand it, yes. And that's by uh, the first? Uh, is that by 1115 or? I think the disclosure kicks in 1114. Oh, oh 14. Okay, I see what you know, it was uh, helpful for us at the Board of Supervisors. We had a representative dogger come and help us understand what their roles were and their jurisdiction was. They, they are probably pretty busy right now, but it would be nice if they could come to our APCD meeting where yeah, we can I, have I a better that. understanding of this because there are a lot of things where we are going to have to work with Dogger in terms of um, coordinating with the APCD and, and probably to some degree with the County of Ventura also. But I think that it would be good to, you know, be on top of it instead of playing catch up. So, I, you know, I, I would also like to see, for example, our county have a link on our website to the Dogger website that will have the information or if it's going to be frac focused, you know, so we have a link so people in Ventura County can go on and, and easily find out what wells in Ventura County are, are being fracked and acidized. Mm -hmm. But there, there are things that I think uh, there's an EIR, state EIR period, and I believe um, Senator Pavley wanted to uh, have a hearing out here in Ventura County in the Central Coast area. So again, APCD will have an opportunity to have input on that, and so it would be good to you know, stay on top of it so we can stay involved in the process and see that it meets the needs of Ventura County too. Um, you bring up a very interesting point with that statewide EIR. That's causal. I didn't cover it because it's caused quite a bit of consternation and confusion with this legislation because it says you can continue hydraulic fracturing and acidizing in this state. And one of the requirements is to have a statewide EIR, and as you're well aware, EIRs take quite a time to develop, and if they're challenged, that's even longer. So I'm not sure. <laughs> There's some people that are concerned what exactly that means, both the regulators and the operators. And then, and so just the, the beginning input period would be good to be in, involved in that, but you're right, it takes a, could take well over a year to do the EIR. And then, as I understand, that they can then look back at existing projects and put mitigation measures on that. And that, again, would be something that our county and the APCD may want to have input on what are appropriate mitigation measures, if any. So there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of input that we need to be able to give, and I think it will be helpful to have us educated in understanding what our needs are and, and having that available for the public to give us their input also. But, I think our, that would be a good idea if we our, can have a representative from Dogger County. That's a great idea. I think our council wants to say something. Yeah, through the chair, Chair Ramirez, and to the question that uh, Supervisor Parks had, um, Public Resources Code Section 3160 has been amended, and I'll read you the section with regards to the permits. Notwithstanding any other law or regulation, prior to performing a well stimulation treatment on a well, the operator shall apply for a permit to perform well stimulation treatment with the supervisor or district deputy. Then that section goes on to list what information they need to include in that permit application. There is no date about when that is to begin, so under, the understanding is that it would apply almost immediately. And, and that supervisor district, that is in reference to the Dogger staff person. The Dogger staff person. And just having that coordination so we know in our county it's on our website, you know, I think that would be the, the minimum that we should be able to do so that we can have that information available. But you do think it should happen. Um, it's currently in effect right now. If you're fracking or acidizing, that information needs to be provided, the chemical con constituents of the fracking fluid, for example? Yes, other, other subdivisions in 3160 have dates of when they start to kick in. This one does not. Do you know if any in Ventura County have already uh, provided the information? I don't have any of that information, I'm sorry. So just 
because we don't, it would be nice to know how do we get that information and if it's required and, and having that available. And I would also hope that it also, excuse me for the time, would incorporate produced water and where the, that is being put and what wells that is being put. And I'm, I'm not sure if that also uh, affects the, the wells that they put produced water in because that can have a lot of contaminants that can get into drinking water, for example, if it's a potable aquifer. Madam Chair, can I add to that? I, I think it's an important information because I've been asked by quite a few people that are concerned about the injection of uh, the materials in those wells and, and what's happening to the water. So I think it's important that the public understand that. So. Do, you, do you know if the bill uh, covered produced water, which is the wastewater that comes from the fracking? Well, it, it covers the, dep the disposition of those fluids. No, I would, I'll, I'll have to discuss what that means with Dogger, but that, that seems like a pretty broad term. It, to me, it would, at minimum, tell me where it was injected, which well it was injected in. Yeah, that's so right. all, all that would be wonderful to have that information, and that's what the public, among other things, has been clamoring for. So it would be nice to know if we can get that. And, and yeah, certainly, we, as you're aware, we work pretty closely with Dogger nowadays. Mr. Morgan this morning, has a question. But uh, we'll be doing that coordination. Yeah. And, one of the things that we need we need to look at because it, it hasn't been said here, but that water that comes up is treated and then reused again. In many cases, remember the explanation we had about the reuse of that water. Uh, it's not that it comes up and they don't reuse it and they put it somewhere. They reuse it again to go back down. Um, so all, uh, also the mitigations. Um, I would hate for us to have our mitigations. LA have, our South Coast have theirs. Other, you're trying to get a common thread on mitigations so you don't. We discussed something earlier when we had uh, different rules in different different areas. Uh, they want to have a standardized mitigation, so I think the state we need to look and see what state does with that before we start looking at doing our own also. Or what South Coast is doing. Yeah, but we need to we need to not just do our own. Sorry. Um, I would just like to say a, lo a lot of um, public concern in my community about this, and mm -hmm. could you just review where an individual would go today to find out? what's going on in their community with this kind of uh, procedure? I, I would Google FRAC, F-R-A-C, focus, and that will get you to the website. And then a map comes up and you you kind of, just like kind of Google Earth, you, you go to your area and then you, you st you'll start to see a map of Ventura County as it blows up and then you'll see the, you know, the little spots where hydraulic fracturing has occurred. You click on those. You get the disclosure of the chemicals used, the date, how, the depth, that type of information. Okay. Other comments, questions? But I think the idea of yes. bringing a, a dogger representative here to APCD is a, is a good idea. Yeah, they, they were very responsive and, and willing to do that. I, also, just because we have extra copies, I wanted to mm -hmm. pass out. I know the Board of Supervisors has already received, but this is just over the last 10 years, incident reports of, uh, as a result of uh, oil wells in the county. Just, it's amazing at how many incidents there are just in the last 10 years, and so it gives you an idea that this isn't something that is uh, foolproof by any means. Were these cleaned up? It comes right from the Dogger uh, information. All right. Uh, Supervisor Parks, uh, is there a way for the public to have access to this document? that you're providing? How would they do that? Uh, well, uh, this was provided to my office, and we made copies of it, but it, I believe came from, it, well, I know it came from Dogger through uh, a request of their public records, but it is available from Dogger. Was this cleaned up? What do you mean by cleaned up? Was this, uh, for instance, is, is any of this oil based on the ground cleaned up stuff? Oh. Yeah, right. every time there's an incident, there is a, re right. a response. So, yes, these all had responses. And they all had, because I know that uh, they have to have backhoes out there to clean. The one I was surprised about, mm -hmm. they talk about the soil, they have to have it take soil away. Right. And some of these so, are just very small so, incidents, but yes. some could be a million gallons. And either way, it's, it's one little teeny line. <laughs> Hopefully, they, they clean them up like supposed to. Other comments? Hearing none. Do we um, need a motion to receive, or do we just? We have it. 
I'll, I'll move that we receive, and then also if uh, a dogger representative can come answer some of the questions that are that are still out there, I think uh, that would be something that we would request mm -hmm. at our next meeting, if possible, or the meeting after that, whenever there's they can come. Is there a second? There's a second. Second by Supervisor Foy. Did I hear that correctly? All right. Okay. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Villegas. So we'll go on to something a little more fun. <laughs> yes. Over the years, the district has partnered with many I, I businesses and other that. entities on our public information and outreach programs. Mm -hmm. These include the County of Superintendent of Schools, VCTC, the Lung Association, Kmart, Bonds, Home Depot, Toys R, Toys R Us. And we've really worked with these agencies, and we've also worked with media outlets such as KVTA, KDBY, KHA, the Ventura County Star, and many more to improve the outreach of our programs. And through these partnerships, we've reached a much broader community than we could have done so on our own. They also help link the district with the community and get that air, clean air message out there. Today, we're going to propose another partnership, and this is an exciting one. The district, in partnership with the Gold Wings Children Museum, would create an interactive exhibition presenting air as a precious natural resource, much in the way exhibitions related to water have been used. This would be a partnership between the district and the Gold Wings Children's Museum. We anticipate the exhibit would be completed during 2014. The requested amount of up to $40,000 would be used to go to a vendor who specializes in creating museum exhibits. And this is not something that's just being proposed here in Ventura County. The South Coast District has a uh, aimed at young people, a fuel cell exhibit at the California Science Center, Santa Barbara District has a exhibition at the Santa Maria Children's Museum. I want to point out that this money is included in the district's budget for outreach, and this is we're doing this program in a lieu of perhaps a different program, but I believe this is a really unique program. This exhibit would <laughs> raise children's awareness about air quality, why clean air is important, what makes the air dirty, and what an individual can do to help clean the air, even a child. This anticipated exhibit at the Gold Wings Museum can take this clean air message to more county children in one year than we can reach on 20 years on our own. Gold Wings is visited by approximately 30,000 students on a countywide basis. I know my mom, when she was an aide in Simi Valley at Township Elementary, she was, I know, going on field trips to Gold Wings Museums with that class, so it extends to not just West County, but East County also. It's a perfect fit for our educational efforts on air quality and will complement the current museum exhibits related to history, science, and health. I'd also like to point out that under state law, California Health and Safety Code requires the district to undertake public information and outreach efforts within our jurisdiction. And I can't think of a more important area than edu educating children on the importance of air quality at this time. This project was the vision of our public information manager, Barbara Page, and will be under her direction with assistance from museum staff. And I strongly recommend that your board approve the proposed project. Board comments? I would just say I know Gull Wings, and I know the terrific people involved, in it and want to encourage everybody to go visit. Uh, but we do have a public speak. Uh, a card for public speaking. That's Miss Julia Chambers from Goldings. Good afternoon, uh, APCB board members. Thank you for having me here. I think it is afternoon. Perhaps just just on the nose here. Um, I am so pleased to be here today, and um, we, I hope there's enough. Uh, I, I think Carmen may already have one, I mean, Chair Ramirez may already have one. Um, this is a small introduction to what wonderful things we have been doing recently at Gull Wings Children's Museum. If you haven't been, I echo Chair Ramirez's invitation to come and visit us. I'd love to show you around, and um, my staff also. 
Um, so Gull Wings Children's Museum is Ventura County's Children's Museum. We have been there for 25 years. In fact, Mr. Villegas was just telling me his <coughs> twins, who are now 17, celebrated their first birthday there <laughs> at a birthday party. So um, we have been a long time. Um, our mission is to allow children and their grown-ups to play, imagine, and engage in the unique things that are represented in Ventura County. So we focus right in on the incredible things and have great plans to keep on doing that and celebrate more and more. Um, we host people from locally, from Ojai, Santa Barbara, um, of course, right in our area here, but they come from Los Angeles, Calabasas, uh, you know, Simi Valley, so we are covered, and then some for our county's uh, service. So this museum would be an excellent venue to teach stewardship of our environment. Um, truly, um, it's now the children who are teaching us, I find in my house anyway, you know, Mom, turn off the water, what are you doing? Um, they're teaching their parents, and what a wonderful opportunity this would be to expose parents and children to this interactive exhibit, um, which the education provided by this would, um, by this proposed exhibit, would help families as well as future generations. If you read through the description, it is true, this is crucial. I mean, to be able to breathe our own air is one of the basic things, and I can't imagine a better way than to start with our children and their parents who accompany them to the museum and, and, and teach these lessons. So I appreciate this partnership opportunity, and I really do want to thank Barbara Page and, and Mr. Vegas for, for allowing this to even come, come to your eyes, and, and we are just so thankful. Um, we have many strong relationships already in the community. Um, the city of Oxnard, of course, where we've been... Um, a home uh, for 25 years and also the county and many representatives. Um, we'd like to have stronger relationships always, of course, but we work with CSUCI, we work with the police departments, we work with fire, um, we work with Ocean Lovers Collective, that's another good one that we're starting where we're exploring the water and how our families can truly appreciate and take care of our water. Um, and again, we're open to many more. Um, so in the last 18 months, we have been in growth mode. So what we've been able to do, we're going to be able to do even further. Um, we have uh, rebranded. Um, I hope you'll see your very beautiful uh, brochures that are in your packet. We've redecorated. We've reprogrammed. Our programming rivals any museum, I'd say, definitely in the area in Los Angeles, in the country. We teach so many things about science, about art, about the environment, about local heritage, about things that are right here under our noses that are incredible. Um, and want to do so even more. Um, so this exhibit will fit right in. We are also um, looking for increased funding because one of the things we also realized with the uh, reprogramming, redecorating, and rebranding is that we realized we need to move. Uh, we have a small facility on 4th Street in Oxnard and are looking toward other venues that will allow us to do this on a bigger scale. Um, so Gullwings is a place where children learn by interactive play. They have fun. And um, this would be certainly a wonderful opportunity to educate tens of thousands of children's, children and their parents um, about healthy environmental stewardship and um, practices and have a lot of fun in the process, which is the best way to learn. We welcome this opportunity, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you like. Any questions from board members? I, I would like to ask um, regarding the exhibit itself, um, if, and I know uh, Barbara Page is involved, it's going to be top notch, but my question is, will it be able to be reused uh, after it's had its time at the Gull Wings? And, and I, I brought my children there when they were little too, I think a lot of us have been Right there. now, what, the, the MOU that we have with the, is, is a 10 year uh, run at the museum, and we'd have to Come on up, yeah, but we'd have to think about what happens with it after that. So it might be great to be able to take it to a street fair. I'm Bob Barbara Page, the Public Information Manager at the Air District. Right now, the process would be that we would have to put out a request for proposal for the construction and fabrication and installation of the exhibit. Depending on the content, it could be reused. It's also my hope that it will be made out of sustainable materials, and all that will be in the RFP, and that we'll have a bilingual element. But for now, until we see the content from the, the bids, it's hard to say. Sometimes, you know, they only have a shelf life because the technology changes. 
So depending on the content, I would say, uh, yes, that would be something that we may be able to do, but at least it will have 10 years in the uh, museum, which is about the right shelf life for an exhibit anyway. I was involved when I was uh, at the South Coast Air Quality Management District and their public information. I was involved in a, an exhibit at the California Science Center called the Globe Heads, which was land, water, uh, and air, and waste. And I think our, our window uh, was for about an eight-year range on that. It's no longer there, but I think it did last for 10 at the museum. It's now where the challenger is. <laughs> ah. So, yeah. Well, it, it might be something to think about maybe in the RFP language if you could have components that would be able to be reused later too. We, we can certainly do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mr. Zaragoza? Is there a second? Second. We've got a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none. Thank you and congratulations. Let's get those kids on their bikes, too. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, next item, Mr. Villegas, receive and file the unaudited fiscal year 2012, 13 year in financial status report. Attached to the board letter is the district's unaudited financial status report for fiscal year 2012-13. I'm pleased to let you know that based on the unaudited results, the district's operations reported a net savings of $872,000 for the fiscal year. This was due to deferred purchases, salary savings, and reduced operating costs. When we compared the actual amounts to budgeted numbers, our total realized revenue from operations were over budgeted due to increases in fines, penalties, and source testing fees. And I do need to point out that this year was somewhat uh, a fairly significant increase in fines but it was due in large part to one settlement with a company that had been operating without control equipment for some period of time. There were also uh, savings in salaries and benefits and savings in services and supplies. We deferred filling a vacant position and we had a decrease in various operational costs which all contributed significantly to improving our bottom line. Staff will return to your board with the comprehensive financial annual report as soon as our external auditors complete their work and they should be coming to us in a, within a few months. Lastly, for fiscal year 12-13, we received funds to administer our past advance, most notably the Carl Moyer program, and the revenue and expenditure associated with past through grants are reported separately in attachment four to the board letter. And this is because when you look at the pass through grant, grant portion of the budget, there's always a balance between revenue and expenditure so you always have a, a you come out with a net zero at the end of the year and it doesn't affect our financial operations that's all i have i'll be happy to take any questions board questions i i do have just one and that is um i just like to ask you to comment on staffing if you feel that we're lacking staff in certain areas are we at the right place or where are we going well with, with that vacant position one of the things i i'm seeing is that we are facing some challenges in the permit section. And, and the reason I like to keep that section staffed up is that maintains that positive relationship this district has with the regulated community. If we get the permits handled in a timely manner. The other thing is it means is that we're being thorough with that permitting and bottom line that means clean air. So we are gonna be proposing to add a staff position in our engineering division. Mr. Bennett. Um, I didn't get to read the whole article. I just saw the article in the Star this morning, um, so I didn't get to read your response. But there were one of only three um, APCDs that do not go on to people's personal property. Is that a staffing issue, or is that a different issue? And can you? Can yeah, you really. On from that? our perspective, it was a safety issue when that was uh, that policy actually predated me, and I'm, I'm not making any apologies. I. When, that st when we put out a memo in 2011 reiterating to staff that we were not to be entering homes, I did not connect the dots in my mind and go back and say, well, actually, we have a rule that relates to asbestos in homes. And I think that's what led to, that was the genesis of that article. So okay. do you anticipate modifying that? Policy? I'd like to come back to your board. I mean, there's two ways to look at it. We, we talk to most air districts, and there's one thing that's a little, I believe, a little misleading in the article. There are only three air districts that have a policy against going into homes. 
But there are several districts that emailed me re regarding the fact that they were being interviewed that said, we do it only on an extremely rare basis, and only we believe it's absolutely safe. And, and in essence, we need the other thing I need to do is look at our policy and say that we can enter into a residence or a backyard if management concurs that it's safe. And the perfect example would be we were just out at Mr. Tollhill's home. We're, we're in his backyard trying to resolve that issue. And in that case, we did enter private property, a single family residence. So I think those two issues need to be cleaned up to address the concerns raised in Thank the you. article. I agree. Other comments, board members? Hearing none, is there a uh, motion to receive and file? Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Villegas. Next item, uh, receive and file minutes of South Coast, South Central Coast Basin-wide Air Pollution Control Council meeting of August 9th. Any uh, discussion? Move receive and file. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, last item. No, not last item, item 14. Receive and file the application for state subvention funds. So moved. Is there a second? second? Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And last item, receive and file the unscheduled vacancy notice of Gary Gasparino for the Air Pollution Control District Hearing Board. Mr. Sutter goes move. Second for Mr. Sharkey. Thank you all in favor? Any opposed? No. Well, that concludes our um, agenda. Mr. Villegas, are we having a meeting in December? Depending on how the standing committee goes, we could potentially have a meeting dealing with purchase of a building to serve as our offices. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank Maybe you. see you in December. Happy holidays. <laughs>